thanks for having me here. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, I didn't quite know how formal or informal the talk was, so I wrote it. And, I, and now it feels like it's more like a comedian kind of a, <laughs> or like a cabaret type thing. So I will be reading from a paper, but I may digress a little. So, um, Right, so currently, um, as Elsa explained, I'm, uh, doing a, I'm a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Art History and Communication Studies at McGill. Uh, which is funded by uh, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, um, CAN is a fellowship, the SHRC as it's called. Um, for most of this fellowship I've been living outside of Montreal uh, in the UK, uh, conducting research there and in France. Um, at the moment I'm teaching a graduate course on the visual culture of uh, natural therapeutics at McGill, um, and last month my fiancé, who is a Brit, uh, came for a visit uh, for a week to see Montreal. Uh, we were walking towards the old port and we went past the, past the uh, Place des Arts and uh, where we witnessed a spectacle, which is the only way I can describe it as a spectacle. Uh, remembering that I was uh, invited to give this talk tonight, I asked my fiancé to stop and to sneakily take a photo uh, of this gentleman and uh, the surrounding sunbathers, hence the work you see here. Now, I don't know who he is, uh, if he's a regular of these haunts on sunny days such as this, but his performance struck me as poignant and significant in a number of different ways uh, that I'd like to contextualize historically and socially. socially. And um, the first of these ways uh, pertains to the matter of instinct, um, and which is prompted to me actually by his age. Um, I grew up in Mississauga, and uh, as far back as I can remember though, my mother would take us every Christmas and March break to Tampa, Florida, um, to my grandfather's winter residence. Uh, it was a massive park uh, intended for seniors only, uh, complete with swimming pools, tennis courts, and small gardens. I found out later that my grandfather's habit of going south every winter, which never struck me as odd or unusual, was called being a snowbird. I don't know if you know that, if you've heard that term. Um, today, as a scholar um, exploring the history and visual culture of light therapies, I find the word especially interesting uh, because it suggests the annual migration from north to south as a natural, instinctive practice rooted in us as members of the animal kingdom. And sun tanning specifically as a practice was historically known to be linked to ancient sun worship, uh, cults, and instinctual reverence. Indeed, what I find, um, what I most commonly find amongst dissertations, books, and manuals on sun therapy, or heliotherapy as it um, became known, dated anywhere from as early as the 1820s all the way up to the 1940s, is an introduction that begins with an ancient lineage, so to Hippocrates, to Celsus, to Galen, all discussing and recommending sunbathing as therapeutic. That tactic uh, of introducing a therapy by way of its heritage is certainly not new nor unique to heliotherapy, and I see it as a strategy that legitimized heliotherapy by rooting it with an ancient venerated medicine. Sometimes, but not always, however, uh, writers would additionally mention primitive cult practices of worshiping and praying to the light, again, couching it rhetorically within a historical precedent, but also as a matter of natural practice and primitive instinct. This explanation for sunbathing as natural uh, is one of the most powerful and long-standing anchors. So I show you here um, a photograph positioned as the frontispiece for uh, the 1944 book Quarante ans d'Ithiopie by the most famous of heliotherapists, the Swiss physician Dr. Auguste Rollier. In this image, a prepubescent girl is placed at the edge of a terrace at one of Rollier's licensed sanatoria, playfully arching her body like a heliotropic sunflower turning towards the light. The sunshine is so bright in the photo that her arm actually loses contour. seemingly melting away in the act of irradiation. Her white loincloth, the requisite uniform for Roguet's patients, contrasts significantly with her bronze skin, denoting that she is not new to this treatment of sunbathing and she's progressing well. Now, if we juxtapose this photo with a well-known chart that Roguet uh, followed in the therapeutic process, it becomes clear that this was a highly regimented and surveyed practice. The patient was first exposed to sunlight for only five minutes, so as you can see here, starting with the feet. And then the second day, the feet would get 10, and the calves would get five, and so forth and so forth as the days progressed and as moving vertically, but of course always avoiding the head for fear of sunstroke. 
So this was an act of monitored acclimatization to, to the sun treatment. Physicians were insistent that patients undergoing chemotherapy be monitored and that their exposure times carefully scheduled and regimented. Patients militantly lined up conformed to such views, such as this image of children undergoing chemotherapy at the René Sévérin Hospital in Hier on the Côte d'Azur of 1914. As one writer put it in a 1905 article, and I quote, long experience with the nervous and chronically ill has made clear that the sick person without a physician is a ship adrift without a pilot, a traveler without a guide, who too often wastes his effort, his force, his money, and his time, end quote. Doctors Vignard and Jouffre, two heliotherapists, adamantly stated that, and I quote, heliotherapy must be progressive, uninterrupted, total, and supervised. Left to their own devices, the sick person did not apparently revert to instinct. Now returning to Rodier's frontispiece photo, so the image he chose to open his culminating book that covered the last 40 years of his experience with light therapeutics, we are presented with an image of sunbathing not as regimented, scripted and surveyed, but positioned as essentially natural, joyful and liberating. Crucially, such conflicting views of heliotherapy as natural and instinctual yet necessitating medical intervention and regimentation occurred simultaneously throughout the therapy's history and use. Sometimes within one image, uh, both views are projected. So in this 1928 postcard of children taking sun baths on the beach in Hier, we're presented with a photograph of children not militantly lined up, but ha haphazardly laying out in the sand, seemingly relaxed and carefree, and perhaps even reminiscent of our own experiences and memories of sunbathing today. Um, yet they seem, cl clearly they seem to still be under the watchful presence of attendant nurses. And in this photograph of 1914, within that same manual as the photograph of the René Sebran Hospital, the joy radiating from the infant's face as it sits exposed to sunlight is rendered all the more palatable to us as modern viewers by the reassuring presence of the adult safely watching over it. So here is an image of heliotherapy as a liberating, seemingly natural, and enjoyable experience for the patient. Outside the grounds of a sanatorium or hospital, unmonitored, with the exception of uh, here my fiance's camera lens, and surrounded by like-minded individuals undergoing self-directed acts of sun worship, this gentleman enacts what heliotherapists perceived as an age-old practice and as natural as birds flying south and flowers turning towards the sun. Now the second point I'd like to discuss is actually a matter of, it's a matter of process, prompted to me by this man's status as an invalid and his use of a wheelchair. Uh, initially, I was reminded of other mechanical and artificial aids in the past that were used to correct deformations and aid exposure to the sunlight in the heliotherapeutic process. But this series of images, I think, which could be the topic of a, another whole talk, concentrates on a device uh, to isolate exposure of only that infected area. So here's the case of a child with a tuberculous, uh, tuberculosis of the knee joint. So it's an adjunct or aid to the cure. Now, I'm not a doctor, uh, at least I'm not a medical doctor. I'm a doctor, but I'm not a medical doctor. Um, and I have no interest in attempting to diagnose the nature of his disability or the cause of his lack or of restricted mobility. But as a historian of light therapy, I have to wonder if his practice has something to do with seeking out sunlight precisely as therapeutic. In other words, those surrounding him on the steps of the Place des Arts do not appear as invalids, as unhealthy or disabled or sick. But in the foreground is a man who has positioned his wheelchair to face directly the sunshine, to tilt it backwards, and then include additional accoutrements like a beverage, including uh, this might take a while, right? And also his sunglasses. He's, in other words, armed and prepped for this course of action. The juxtaposition of his position and pose to those of the people around him gives us two very different but fundamentally, rela uh, fundamentally related perceptions towards sunlight. The first, um, that it's curative, a natural therapy for treating illness. But that number two, that it is aestheticizing, a natural agent that pigments our white skin in such a way that we perceive to be beautiful. Historically, these two perceptions were intertwined. In the 1890s, when the Danish physician Niels Finsen developed treatment for lupus vulgaris, which is tuberculosis of the skin, using first natural sunlight and then artificial light, or what became known as phototherapy, which we still use today, 
uh, before and after images were utilized to document the efficacy of the therapy. Gruesome and unsightly before images contrasted strongly with the after images. The patient's healed, closed, smooth skin, evidence of her return to a healthy state, so her return to normalcy. And indeed, the images are so far powerful because of that contrast, that space in between, wherein the light therapy intervenes, because it's miraculous and mysterious. How could something so simple, exposure to sunlight, be so effective, particularly during a period of so-called progressive lab-based medicine? Finson, interestingly, was actually awarded a Nobel Prize for medicine in 1903 for his work on phototherapy. For Rodier, uh, before and after images, uh, some with extra after images, equally projected light therapy as miraculous and permanent. Rescued by Pot, uh, from Pott's disease by the sunlight and Rodier's intervention, this woman is presented to us years later as a healthy and normal functioning citizen, happy and even cheeky as she faces the camera. But the connection between a healthy state and Braun's beautiful skin is made overt in Oscar Bernhard's 1926 book on light therapy here. The composition of the image is as fascinating as its accompanying caption. A 19-year-old girl is seductively laid atop a soft white cloth, her face turned away from the camera, and her body arranged to allow for total visual access to the length of her body. Her arm is raised so that her right breast is fully exposed, and her right leg artfully posed to hide her genitals, tantalizing the viewer more. She is a veritable Venus Pudica, arranged like a model for a traditional oil painting or a marble sculpture. From the limited medical information claiming that she suffered from multiple tuberculosis lymptomata, it is impossible to distinguish within the photograph the specific portions of her newly healed skin from the rest of her body. In other words, what are we looking at? What is the purpose of this image? It is clearly a kind of after image, yet without, without a before image to precede it, its purpose becomes obscure. From the caption, we are advised by Dr. Bernhardt to quote, note her fine physique with a smooth, superb bronze skin, end quote. So here to my mind is an example of aesthetic considerations that complement therapeutic preoccupations of the physician, where perceptions of beauty and health converge onto the tanned body. And of course, such perceptions have not left our culture today. The bronze body is beautiful, so countless images of, in magazines of models seem to tell us. And we seek it to the point of excess, to the extent that it becomes a matter of the ridiculous and even frightening. Here, the word tanning can be understood best through its etymological origins, right? Tanning as a process of treating rawhide into leather. Now, another point of, of excess is the sunburn. On the body of the adult, the sunburn is a sign of stupidity, of poor self-monitoring, a painful lesson to be learned, and even a rite of passage during the holiday. On the body of the child, however, it prompts fears of poor parenting, of danger, and of anxiety. We are told endlessly to self-monitor and to self-examine our bodies for the consequences of our excessive and obsessive relationship with the sun. Skin cancer, we are told, is on the rise, and physicians blame it on the sun. That same agent of beauty we so desire to mark us and imprint upon us and give us a tan, in other words. We've also turned to artificial means to simulate pigmentation with chemicals that dye our skin. Such tanning sprays evidently, so this after image tells us by the model's arched pose and windswept hair, make us more confident and seductive. Tans, whether naturally or artificially obtained, make us sexy but only if we do it right. <laughs> the wrong tan attracts only contempt and ridicule because it cannot conceal itself as natural. The artificial means remain readable as artifice and therefore fail. We also seek it artificially through simulated light, uh, a history actually traceable back to the experiments of Finson. The tanning bed has become an object of tremendous controversy uh, laws are now in place to regulate its use and monitoring, um, especially according to the age of the client. Phototherapy lamps of various sizes and forms have been used since the late 1890s. This, um, this is, these are two versions of the Hanna Solux lamp, which dates to the mid-1920s, one of which I own and couldn't help but Today for copyright, see, it's my image because that's my dog. Um, 
And I actually, yeah, I obsessively collect these lamps now. Um, and they projected, a, this particular brand of the Solux projected full spectrum light that could then be reduced only to red or blue light, which was the use of the color filters that would slot into here. And that depended on the, on the treatment. I find lamps like these fascinating, um, not least because the methods for visualizing its use associated the experience as akin to natural sunbathing, so as pleasurable, liberating, and beautifying, and also, we should say here, um, sexy. Now, interestingly, uh, that sunbed I just showed you is actually not used as a UV light machine. Uh, its bulbs have been replaced with those projecting only visible red light. Now, this may look angry and terrifying, uh, but red light therapy is the latest beauty craze. Uh, and it's used to increase the rate of cell production. Indeed, NASA is using this technology to aid recovery for post-operative cancer patients. So you'll see, um, if you go to NASA's website, red light machines are held close to the surgical wound to speed up the healing time. Uh, but this is obviously not one of those machines. Uh, this is a machine for women seeking youthful, radiant skin. Other contemporary light machines are popular for treatment of seasonal affective disorder, or SAD. And these lamps come in a range of sizes, output, and prices. Usually these lamps only produce a blue or a violet light, believed to enhance mood and simulate daylight. But even as our technological advances become ever more complex in replicating natural light, we still seek out the sun. And I think precisely because it is perceived as natural. I've been equally spending time outside this past week, I don't know about any of you, enjoying the sunshine. Um, also, I live in England, so even more so. So just like the individuals in this photo, you know, I can, I can identify with these people. So by way of conclusion, I, I'd like to return to the subject of my grandfather and my mother uh, to the snowbirds. Um, as much as I remember those sun-filled holidays in Florida as a child, so too do I remember upon our return to Canada the visits that both my grandpa and my mom made to the dermatologist. Both of them regularly went to have their small but persistent lesions of skin cancer frozen off, cut out, or dissolved through chemicals. Uh, it wasn't life threatening, it was annoying, they said. But even today, my mother still goes out into the backyard in her home in Brampton when the sun is shining, sand sunscreen. And it stirs up my anger and frustration something awful. She should know better, that's what I think. But therein lies my hypocrisy. As a scholar of light therapeutics, I should technically be the one to know better as well when I go out and do this too. And on the subject of sunlight, I find my scholarly position constantly at war with my personal feelings. Our, and by our I mean white Western society's relationship with light over the past, say, 120 years or so, has been and remains contentious and complex. The sunlight, as dangerous, as necessary, or as pleasurable, continues to fascinate and perplex us, and none more so than, than me. And these tensions deserve teasing out. So this is where I open the floor to you. Thank you.